Uh, okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Trevor Yokoyama with the Young Buddhist Editorial. Uh, today we will be inter interviewing some volunteers from Dharma Relief. Dharma Relief One uh, ran from March 30th to May 18th of 2020, and they raised over $650,000, providing PPE, providing 1.2 million uh, PPE masks. 620,000 masks have been delivered to 173 hospitals across 34 states in North America including Canada and Mexico, and the remaining masks are undergoing custom investigations before being shipped out to North America. So really awesome stuff. Um, if all of you could just one by one introduce uh, uh, yourselves, I guess we can start with Sarah. Yes, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Khan, and I was brought on to Dharma Relief um, from a WhatsApp group that <laughs> my Buddhist meditation teacher, Guo Gu, he had, he basically has a conversation group on WhatsApp. He was like, hey, so there's like a shortage of masks in America. And I know some people in China who have a factory. Can I get some help on arranging, like buying masks from these, my friends and bringing them to hospitals here and slowly started working with him on that. I've been a student of my Buddhist teacher, Guogu, for about three years. Um, and I've actually moved to be closer to him to learn more from him as well recently, like last year. So I live in Tallahassee, Florida. <laughs> That's a little bit about myself. And I work in public health, so I'm a consultant. Um, my consultation is for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I also work for the Tallahassee Chan Center, the meditation center here as well. I'm happy to be joining. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Uh, Greg, if you'd like to go next. Uh, yeah, um, so I'm Greg, Greg Benza. And so, yeah, I have been part of the WhatsApp group um, for quite some time, like pretty much from the very beginning. Um, and, uh, you know, we, um, are constantly talking about various things and you know covid started coming up the coronavirus started coming up and we were constantly talking about it and then i remember sarah organizing with other people um like what would eventually become dharma relief like there was like a, an extra conversation like going on in the in the like regular conversation and it got to this point where it was like almost like hilarious these like two conversations going on and then they kind of like split the um, the group into um and that spinoff became basically dharma relief the people who kind of wanted to continue that conversation that like that nugget of like what can we do the people on the whatsapp like what can we do we kind of like moved into the dharma relief um and um, oh, and about me, I'm um, I'm Greg. I was um, I come from right now. I live in Oregon. I uh, work in the agricultural industry, growing flowers. Um, but before that, I spent five years um, doing residential training and living at uh, Buddhist monasteries, um, spending most of my time at a uh, Soto Zen monastery. Yeah, Greg was a monk. Is yeah. that right? Can I say that? Okay. <laughs> It was an interesting experience. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Uh, Yiling, would you, would, you, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yes, um, so my name is Yiling Ling. Um, I, I'm currently a PhD student in anthropology and live in St. Louis. I was also joined Google's retreat. I, won't, I usually try to go there once a year. So I have been doing that for two times with him and then the COVID started. I think I also ran into, I, I was, when I went to Tallahassee, I also met Greg and Sarah in the retreat. So it was kind of interesting that during the retreat, you usually don't have a chance to talk to each other, but then the COVID started. And as, as Sarah and Greg described, we were originally in one, one um, WhatsApp group, I think it's World of Chan, and then, in the end of March last year, Google was asking, uh, hey, are, are you guys interested in doing that? And then I remember I was really in the situation that 
I wanted to help. I don't know what to help and how to help. So when he say, okay, do you want to like support this project? And then I think, okay, sure, I want to do it. So, and then we just, it was really encouraging because a lot of people jump in and people just start to take their own work. And then very quickly, the project just put to get, get put together and then raise a lot of money and we can start to contact people to donate um, PPE. So that I think that we can talk about the process more, but that was that was how I get into this project and something about myself. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Anna, do you want to ask them your first question? Yeah, sure. Um, so you kind of already answered, you know, how, how did everyone get involved with Dharma Relief? But I wanted to hear just a little bit more about, you know, what exactly got you guys started and how did you you know, that timeline, you started in March, 2020, how did you put it into action so quickly? I think it was like a lot of free time because that was, everyone was stuck at home in that first week. And I don't know, just nothing to do. And Guogu, our teacher was like constantly texting us <laughs> about it. So you feel compelled to answer back. And then it, it was just, yeah, we all worked together and um used all of our skills together to make it happen and just like constantly talking i think our whatsapp group went it was like morning till night basically like pinging all the time for like the first week which is when the majority of the fundraising happened as well it was like within we set like a first goal for a hundred thousand we're like i don't know who will see what happens we'll just <laughs> let all our friends know and then Gogu was like yeah i'll talk to all my like buddhist other teacher friends and i'll see if they're interested and then we met the 100,000 mark in like a day. And then we're like, okay, maybe 300,000. And then like all these different Buddhist groups, like their volunteers and people just like donated, they just poured in money. And then me, Greg, Elang, and Guogu were like, what do we do with all this money? And then like we raised it to 600,000. And then it was like, okay, we need to buy masks with all this. And then so like we started putting orders in the hospitals and then like with the factory and then like finding hospitals to mail it. That's a very long story short, I guess. I think one of the interesting parts about the speed was um, the amount of like kind of karmic forces and the power behind like a shutdown, a lockdown of the economy, um, people getting out of their jobs, like a, a historical pandemic. There was just like a ton of energy. Um, and I think the, the original chat group was just like on fire in general with all sorts of stuff. And there was a tremendous amount of energy. And I think um, kind of like it was, you know, we kind of were like, well, what if we, you know, kind of push this energy into one direction? And um, Sarah, before you got on, we were talking just about one of the really cool things with Dharma Relief is just the wealth of knowledge and how like the depth of um, the resource that Dharma Relief is. And so, you know, immediately there's all this energy and one person would be like, oh, I can really contribute in this one particular way. And I'm actually quite good at it. And I'm going to go all out because I'm not working. And it's just like, Poof, they're gone. And then someone else is like, well, oh, that reminds me of this one thing I'm good at. And I'm going to do this part and I'm going to do, and Poof, they're gone. And everyone's like, okay, I can do this. And then they, just everybody putting all of this energy into what they're good at for a very explicit like karmic goal is getting masks into people's hands. And that was really like, how can we do this? And like just taking these big forces and moving together uh, as one, but also like within our individual skill set, really kind of got um, got masks into hands really quickly. Yeah, I also remember one thing was um, sometimes we get into some some sort of dis discussion. For example, what kind, which uh, which health pillow should we help, mm -hmm. or like which one should be the part in the priority? And Google will usually jump in and start to like, kind of remind us what is the main goal we wanted to do, and then we want to distribute our PP to a wide um, majority. But at the same time, we also want to identify. We, who, what are the uh, hospitals which is harder hit it? And then so I remember there, at the beginning, there were a lot of information analyze, like data analysis, and then Sarah had been making a map to show 
what what are the hospitals that needed more PPE? And then so the information has been like flow really quick just because of everyone has those knowledge and then they're um they are all talent with doing that. So it, that was really impressive to see that everyone is spending their time and energy and it's not about like one person or two person is that it's doing this as a group. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So it seems uh, it seems like this one group chat kind of just took on more members, more members, and then that's where Dharma Relief really started. And that's how you had all these connections and networking through all across the United States and to China, which allowed for the PPE to, to come so quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. guess. Oh. I think there is, sorry, I just wanted, I, if I don't remember it wrong, we, we were also kind of have some connection with the Dama Zhuang Mountains people who were in China, right? Because yeah. they need to talk to the manufacturer, right? Yeah, that's right. So it was like one of the meditation centers in Hong Kong, Dharma Drum, Hong Kong, that was kind of Guogu's contact. And then their volunteers, new people at this factory that happened to be manufacturing masks. And because they had like connections with people, they gave that uh, price for the masks that are really discounted price. Mm -hmm. So they were the ones like on the ground, kind of like going, talking to the factory owners and being like, okay, this is how much money that's been raised and how much, how many masks can we get from that? And like the woman who we worked with most, she used to be like a professor at some college in California. And then she retired and moved back to China, but she was still like meditating and volunteering her time at um, the Dharma Drum center in Hong Kong. So she was like the main force behind all of this and really talking to the factories and talking to Guogu. Like we had like late night calls with her at like 2 a.m. our time here and like just figuring out like the whole, um, all of the stuff, <laughs> like getting the masks here and how much to buy, things like that. Awesome. Uh, is the Darba drum, uh, was, is that group similar to your group in terms of Buddhist sect or is something different? How, how is that connection formed is my question. Yeah. Oh, good, great question. Okay. So uh, let's see. I guess all three of us uh, meditate in the Dharma drum lineage, which was, it's like one of the, it's the, like out of the four biggest monasteries in Taiwan, it's like, it's one of the four big ones. So Dharma drum has lots of different meditation centers across North America. Canada, um, Europe. Actually, no, they don't have one in Europe. But anyway, that's where um, me, Elaine, Greg have been meditating at. And that's how we kind of know each other, even though we live far away, because we might show up at the same meditation retreat, like that's held somewhere. Um, and specifically, um, there's one teacher in this lineage, Guogu, who's like amazing. <laughs> so that's why we go to his retreats more than like other retreats so that's how and he also he's really active socially and like um has this whatsapp group for example for us all to like join and talk to each other and share experiences about meditation and buddhist practice specifically uh, so we all practice in the dharma drum lineage if that makes sense although i think greg started off perhaps in a different lineage but it's similar it's like zen basically uh I and and to kind of put into perspective the relationship between um, Dharma Drum and Tahasi Chan and um, Guogu, I was a Soto Zen practitioner and I was kind of leaving Soto Zen for various reasons and I was um, had jumped into Dharma Drum like that was the um, that was this school that I was really interested in I was going to all these Dharma Drum retreats and doing various Dharma Drum stuff and then um, you know, I'm used to in Zen where you don't really engage with practice without a teacher. And so it was odd in that Dharma Drum centers aren't really teacher based. They're more like community based than they invite teachers from the outside. Um, they come and they kind of do a retreat, but it's mostly just about the community. And so I actively went looking for a teacher in the Dharma Drum lineage. And that is how I met Gugu. And so I went to Tallahassee Chan. Um, so maybe that helps or something. <laughs> That's interesting um, because I'm originally from Taiwan. So I, I was curious how other people join this Dharma <laughs> Drum lineage uh, in Taiwan because Dharma Drum was originally from there. So there are lots of um, um, centers and also lots of retreats. And then I joined the retreat when I was in college 
orange still. And when I moved to St. Louis, I found out they have a small branch in St. Louis. We don't have any uh, like venerable here. So how it works is that Greek describe is our center will have to invite venerable from different center of the Amazon. And then one year, Gogu was here. So that was how I met Gogu. And then because of that, you kind of get a chance to get in contact with different teacher and then know who might be the person who have a, a in Buddhist way you would say, have a deeper connection with you. And then so you, I, that's why I start to go to Gogu's retreat more, but also bring, bring back what I learned from him to our local community. So that is something that I have been benefit a lot from everyone. Yeah. yeah, I actually went to yeah, the- I just wanna, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, there's the Dharma Drum in Fremont. So it's like about, if you just take the bar, it's like, I don't know, an hour away, not even 45 minutes. And that, I used to go to that one um, before I met Gobu. Yeah, thank you all for sharing that. I just wanted to kind of bounce off of that question. I think everyone would be really interested, like our audience would be interested to hear what you guys do at your retreats because we have, you know, we have like our own youth retreats and I'm sure it's way different than yours. So if you wanted to share maybe some personal experiences with that. Hmm. We sit. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the Some of the, um, the fundamentals in the Chan tradition is the kind of like the, the retreats do change a bit based on where the students are and how they're doing in that particular retreat. And then the retreats are also um, very different depending on who the teacher is as well. Um, and sometimes the practices can be pretty different. Um, I had one Dharma drum teacher where during our walking meditations, we did um, recitation. So we did do a recitation of the Buddha's name um, during the walking meditation. Um, but usually it's focused on seated meditation in about half an hour to 45 minute um, periods punctuated with walking um, and various other like work and things like that. But what people are working on in meditation, like when they're seated is different depending on where they are in their practice and how the teacher, like what the teacher wants them to work on. So even though there might be like three people sitting right next to each other, they might actually be working on three different techniques and be having like three very different experiences. Um, but we all like work together and like follow the schedule together and are guided by our teacher. Um, so it's really hard to say what an actual retreat looks like other than a lot of sitting. <laughs> yeah, it just looks from the outside. We're just all sitting, looking at a wall for 16 hours a day for seven days, if it's a seven day retreat, which is what we're doing. But internally, we're all working on a method to basically uproot greed, hatred, ignorance. <laughs> That's what at least Buddhist principle of lessening those in our mind and the best way to do that is sticking with a method for like as much as you can and seeing the workings of your mind so not very glamorous the retreats but <laughs> that's it's really great i recommend you guys mm. try it one day a silent rich meditation retreat it's really awesome i wouldn't yeah. tell myself too short <laughs> it is exciting <laughs> I think I can provide some something because I start with youth, uh, Dharma Drums group, youth group in Taiwan. So actually before I came to the United States, I have never been to um, a, a strict retreat. So I mean, in Taiwan, the youth retreat is also seven days, but you have a lot of time doing other things <laughs> because they think you won't be able to sit there, like don't move. So I remember you. Oh, they also usually invite different venerable from different parts. Um, I remember the first time. Oh no, the second retreat I went, the venerable was coming from Malaysia, and he also have some. Uh, he he was also the student of Master Shen Yan. So, so every time when you went to retreat, you have different master, and of course you learn different kind, a similar technique but different way to. I mean, he will explain in different way, and usually for use, he will. Like they, they, they try to teach you how to practice in your daily life. So it's not about just sit there. They will talk to, I remember sometimes they will, will do um, walking meditation, but they will ask you to hold a bowl of water, to observe the water movie, make sure the water don't, don't fall out. And you also have more time to kind of work together with 
other participants. So uh, that's how that's that's the experience I had in Taiwan when I went came to the United States and went to retreat. I started to think, oh my God, this is so hard. This is not like what I had before. But it's also interesting that because in Taiwan there are a lot of practitioners, so usually you don't have a very close connection with the teacher. Usually they are be they will be like three hundred other practitioners at the same time, so you don't really have time to have in like individual uh, interviews. But when I start to go to Tallahassee, there's time for you to actually talk to a teacher, ask your personal question. And that was an entirely different level of um, practice. So yes, I really, I really enjoy it. Although I think it was also fun for the youth <laughs> retreat. Um, I didn't want to add one thing. Um, Cause uh, so I have like met, you know, a few Jodo Shu, Jodo Shinshu priests. Um, I've been to a few like, Buddhist churches of America and um, but when we say we're sitting, so we're grounding ourselves and we're using the seated uh, meditation posture to allow our bodies to relax completely so that in the cross-legged or, you know, also kneeling and sitting, but in particularly cross-legged, our abilities to relax all the muscles is a lot easier. You tend, you stay upright when you're sitting cross-legged. Um, and it allows your mind and body to become like incredibly relaxed and it creates, um, Kind of a launching point for several meditation techniques. So primarily you start with following the breath. Um, usually the very beginnings, you're counting the inhalations and exhalations. Usually you get to like one or two and then you forget and you got to start back again. Um, and as that kind of progresses, you start to learn to follow the breath um, in a you know very traditional form of Buddhist uh, meditation. And then what Chan, which is, you know, Dharma relief is based in, um, there are other methods, primarily there are two methods, um, silent illumination and huato. Um, uh, they're a bit more, require a bit more conversation than what it, we can do here though. So I'll kind of leave it at that. Cool, thank you. That was, it's, it's, good, to, it's, it's good to explore what other types of Buddhism likes to do in the retreats and stuff like that. Um, for our youth retreats, they're, a lot less intense, I'd say. Usually there would be a, a few workshops by different ministers, uh, just some time to just hang out with each other. And then obviously just like multiple services throughout a day. And usually it's a, a, around a weekend, maybe if there's a three day weekend, maybe we do it like that, but yeah, awesome. Um, I think our next question will probably pivot towards um, uh, the next steps for Dharma Relief. It, it was um, from, Hold on, Mike. I have the date written down. Uh, from March 30th, 2020 to May 18th, 2020. Are there plans for a next Dharma Relief, a Dharma Relief 2, or anything like that? Yes, excellent question. Um, so it's like right after the Dharma Relief 1, that the masks was over with. It was right around that time when um, there was a lot of kind of racial protests coming. That was like with the murder of Amit Arbery, like the who died with um, the policeman's boot on his neck, and there was just a swelling of um, just protests around racial injustice. So naturally, I think Guolu basically is very sensitive, obviously, to the plight of other people, and he saw all of us together working on this um, project from Dharma Relief One, and he thought can I do for addressing kind of this racial reckoning? So he rounded up all of his like old, old Dharma buddies and his Buddhist teacher friends. And is basically for the past seven or eight months has been in conversation with black Buddhist teachers and building kind of alliances with them and talking with them and basically him and other um, leaders in the Buddhist field are making this group where they just released their mission statement last week, which is essentially to make all Dharma centers in North America more racially inclusive. So if you imagine if you're someone who is a person of color, if you're Black, and you go to a Dharma center that's primarily white or Asian, you feel automatically not included. Um, so how can we make 
these Dharma centers more um, just appealing or not as threatening for people who are of color to feel safe to explore. So one such, well, there's actually three things that people can do. One is addressing their own. So specifically for Dharma teachers, for maybe even priests in the Jodo Shinshu line to, or anyone really, to explore their own biases, racial biases that we have, we all have. So trainings for people who haven't undergone kind of diversity or racial awareness training, that level of engagement. Two, also addressing the trauma um, for a lot of Black Buddhist practitioners um, that they invariably have from decades of living in society that have marginalized them. There's a lot of trauma that comes with that. So providing trauma healing for teachers who have had that level of um, just pain that has come to their practice in Buddhism. Um, and then third, making that available to all Buddhist communities. So the plan is once we kind of test out this framework of one, giving trauma healing to the Buddhist teachers and two, doing kind of diversity awareness and racial awareness trainings for example, like the white teachers, so they can recognize when someone has trauma and also recognize their own biases. Once we've tested that out on like this internal small group of teachers, then making that available for all Buddhist centers across North America. And we plan to fundraise again, basically, and also hopefully Dharma Drum will help out as well and other sponsors in fundraising so that for example, a Zen center in Arkansas could apply for the program and they would have a representative, like their priest at that center or the priest themselves, either their representative or their priest themselves will get this kind of certification of they, they have diversity training, they know how to make their center inclusive for um, people of color to visit. Because that doesn't exist currently and it's really a shame for our Dharma centers across North America. So even if this is one thing we could do, that would be really nice. So that's that's the next step is kind of racial justice. <laughs> and then Dharma Relief 3, I'm not sure if that's gonna be down the line, but yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome. It's very relevant to the times we, we live in, I believe. Uh, YBE itself, we're trying to do some other outreach within our own community about racial justice and such. So maybe perhaps there could be cl collaboration in the future. Yeah, of Whoever's course, reading this, uh, take note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, Anna, uh, do you have any other questions? Yeah, I just wanted to see also if like Greg and Yiling, if you wanted to expand more on what you were talking about earlier before we started the recording on like what you were saying about vaccinations and everything, that does not have to do with um, Dharma relief, but maybe what you're doing personally with that. Uh, yeah, for me, it, it's particularly um, powerful because um, of my work situation is really, really, really high risk. Um, and there's already been a COVID outbreak at my work. Um, it was before I started there, but it was like, I think like seven people got COVID. No one was, no one was like really sick, but like people were out for sure. And who knows how many people like actually got it, but didn't get tested. Um, and um there are some cultural traits that sometimes come from like like your karmic formations your karmic backgrounds whether it's like living in large communities without having um like access to masks or healthcare or like health information um it can be really devastating um when the community lacks like health information um in general and so um i just like i felt really uncomfortable um not saying anything but i can't like me being like oh you're wrong about this or like this needs to be done this way because i'm telling you to do it this way is not like it was not going to make people more people more likely to get vaccinated um so i was just kind of like went asked the boss like hey can i just like spend some time like putting together some information um and it actually has been really well received and sarah thank you that was actually really helpful so i like used your links as a launching off point but 
um because we're all in where i'm in, in northwest oregon um agricultural workers are available to get vaccinated on the 29th and i really <laughs> want us to get vaccinated um at my work um I think, you know, some cultural traits um, that people who I work with share uh, make it very difficult to deal with um, like crowd diseases. So like getting vaccinated really, really is the best option in this case and dispelling any myths um, is really important. And I'm the first to just mention that from like when I started hearing about a rushed process on the vaccine and I didn't know a lot about mRNA, messenger technology, that kind of stuff, I knew none of it. I was very skeptical too. Um, and from like a different perspective, like I want the N higher in their control. I want, you know, I want longer term data. Like I wanted like this stuff that I just, you know, wasn't gonna get. Um, and now we've gotten to a point where how many millions of people have been vaccinated for, you know, months and months and months. Um, and then the information like mRNA vaccines can't even really do long-term damage. Um, so just making, making like me feeling better about it was a big relief. So like being able to like pass on that like relief um, was really important to me. And I think that's a huge part of that is based on uh, Dharma practice, like just, both through our meditation training and being in tuned with everybody around you and just like really starting to kind of build um, connections. Um, and then just being like, well, I live in a world where if I just sit and do nothing, someone's going to get hurt. And that is not our vows. We are, you know, we vow to be bodhisattvas, like all of us do. Like we are bound to end greed, hatred, and delusion for all beings. What can I do right now in this situation? And that was just gathering information. And it took like a few hours. So like, you know, um, and th thank you for asking also, Greg, like when you asked on WhatsApp, like if anyone knew of resources, because I think asking for help and building community is awesome. Like when you asked me, I asked one of my friends, I know she's having a hard time right now. She's like alone. And I asked her to help find some resources in Spanish because she's real, like she knows Spanish. She lives in California. And I think she was so happy to have helped with that. Like she spent like the whole day looking for those resources and I sent it to you. So it's just like this chain of events. And I think that's a lot of what Dharma Relief is. It's brought us all together in our own ways. So it's yeah. really awesome. And I mean, it's, it's it, it, to kind of play on that, like of the turning of the wheel. I mean, like it only takes like seeing some suffering and then me getting like this impulse to help and contacting you and then like, this, this big machine starts turning and like now that this pack of information I made is going to get distributed to like people and they're going to give it to other people and like it's all because of this group helped and there might because of like when you start getting to you know to numbers like this might literally save a life like down the line with you know when it starts to disseminate enough like this little activity of two people on Dharma Relief engaging um, in this practice together just might actually have saved a life. So, and who knows how many lives were saved by those masks, man. Like, and so, like second thought I haven't it's true. It before, but like legit, like that was a really good idea. <laughs> was really good. Yeah, it was like 1.3 million masks. How many yeah. one life was saved, I don't know, hopefully. And like we, that was back when like, there were no masks. You guys remember that? Like none, like zero. Like you, like people were like, oh, I found this thing on the internet that teaches you how to make a cloth mask. Like, no way. Like, so, yeah. yeah, I agree. I actually, I think my, my own uh, practice is still not deep enough for me to always aware what is going on around me. But because of this group, I, so when Sarah and Greg was talking about the vaccination, I started to notice, oh yeah, I should also pay attention to our, <laughs> our senior Sangha. So during our weekly meeting, I will ask them that, oh, how, how, do you, how do you guys doing? Do you know where to get your vaccination? So that was actually a good reminder for myself to pay attention to this kind of information. And then, then I also spread, like, expand that to other people who I was in contact with. And then speaking of the mass, I remember, Back then, I, I mean, aside from Dharma Relief, I was also in two other mass distribution projects in, in St. Louis. So I remember there were people ordering. Actually, even the fabric mask was not able to be purchased. So then I remember I was helping to group to purchase those fabric masks from Taiwan and then ship them to you know, St. Louis and then distribute to nursing homes. So, and I was basically using the, the uh, 
the knowledge I have learned from Dharma Relief. So I can quickly help people to distribute their uh, material. So I, yeah, like turning the wheel that, that this wheel is continue turning and expanding to a different area. So that was really nice. Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest like takeaway that I could give your listeners um, based on like what I know about your listeners is that like, you know, if you and a bunch of your friends that are like really like legitimately interested in ending greed, hate and delusion for all beings, regardless of anything, race, faith, like X status, if you, if you guys really are interested in that and you guys like group up, like you, like stuff happens, like you make things happen. Um, you know, it might take the, a lot of connections to make stuff happen, but when you get together as a group with, for a good purpose, those connections, they turn out they're there. And then you kind of like help each other to the point where you, things that you never thought you could do on your own or be part of actually happen. Um, so, so organize like all of you guys together and like do good things. Um, even like in the Bay area, like we used to do interfaith breakfasts where we did go to like Catholic churches and stuff like that and serve food to homeless and things like that with them. Um, different Zen sanghas and stuff like that. And man, we made so much good stuff happen, just like getting up early and going to do that. And yeah, like band together with your friends and and like do good work together. That's my last thing I think I could say. <laughs> awesome, thank you. That's super powerful. And I definitely agree that a small band of people can make such a huge difference. Having Dharma Leaf, even with YBE, they started with like 10 of us and now it's large, I guess is the word I'd use. Um, we're coming, we're coming back uh, up on our closing time. If there's anything else, any final thoughts anyone else would like to say, now is the time. Nope. Okay. Uh, thank you to our volunteers from Dharma Relief. This was awesome. Um, I've, the work you've done is incredible, and I look forward to everything else that you guys can achieve. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you.